So New York City's draft began on Saturday, July 11, 1863. The names of more than 1,000 draftees appear in the newspapers the next day. That weekend, there was great griping and grumbling on the street, on street corners and stoops and beer halls and saloons. Some prepared to protest come Monday when more draftees would be announced at the draft office uptown on 3rd Avenue. Early Monday morning, word spread that waves of white men in lower Manhattan, iron workers, dock workers, construction workers, had gone on strike. Banging pots as they trooped up to Central Park for a no-draft rally, the strikers roused others, stonemasons, carpenters, cartmen, to walk off their jobs. A march on the draft office followed the rally, and before long, mayhem. <coughs> Telegraph poles hacked up, rail tracks yanked up, wooden fences ripped apart with planks, crowbars, bricks, broad axes, knives, and guns. And the kids from this a good part. A whirlwind of mobs went wild. I know, I've been to classes where they, they say that's the best part. The rioters, immigrants, and natives were of various white ethnicities, with the majority Irish, then the most downtrodden white New Yorkers. At the same time, many of the firefighters and police officers who tried to quell the chaos were also Irish. And that was a point in writing where I had to have a moment to say, okay, this is the truth, but as I'm writing this, I have to imagine Irish kids reading this and black kids reading this and not wanting them to think, oh, all the Irish were bad and all. So I had to think, how can I tell history, but, but be aware that you know, there's a difference between what, what, you, what I write and what the kids read. <laughs> And it also helped that who came to Marich's father's rescue? Yeah. Officer Kelly. <laughs> yeah, I was like, <laughs> whatever the ethnicity, the rioters had common targets, pro-war politicians and other government officials, rich people, abolitionists, and blacks of all classes. During four days of savage rage, mobs assaulted draft officials and police officers. They attacked mansions on Fifth Avenue and elegant townhouses elsewhere in the city. They dragged blacks from streetcars, chased them down broad avenues and skinny cobblestone streets, and courted them in alleys. One mob torched and looted the orphanage for black children where Marich's godfather served as head physician. Marich's home came under assault around 6.30 p.m. on the second day of the riots with, quote, a rabble breaking window panes, smashing shutters, and partially demolishing the main front door. Fortunately, some Something drew the mob's attention away from her home. Marich's parents barricaded their front door using stones the mob had hurled at their home. According to a New York Times article, nine of the inmates were injured. Presumably, these were boarders. Marich made no mention that her parents were hurt during the attack, nor of her and her siblings' whereabouts at the time. She only indicated that, quote, before dusk, they were in a far safer place, quite possibly in Williamsburg, across the East River. That night, Marich's parents sat on guard in their front hall, quote, determined to protect their property. Lights having been extinguished, a lonely vigil of hours passed in mingled darkness, indignation, uncertainty, and dread. Just after midnight, a yell announced that a second mob was gathering to attempt assault. Footfalls up the front steps of 20 Vanderwater Street followed the yell. Before troublemakers could close in, Marich's father, I'm sure, he had a form of nonviolent man, advanced into the doorway and fired point blank into the crowd. <laughs> that single shot sufficed to scare the rabble off. Marisha's father was no doubt trigger ready when around dawn he again heard footsteps nearing his home. Don't shoot, Al. It's only me. The speaker was a police officer named Kelly. This kind-hearted man, Marisha wrote, sat on our steps and sobbed like a child. Officer Kelly lamented that when he heard about the attack, he had been unable to send help, and help was what Marich's parents needed the next day, when another mob mounted an attack, this one fiercer, sending them to flight. Marich's father hopped the back fence and raced to a nearby police station on Oak Street, quote, pursued through the streets by a howling mob, a newspaper later reported. Marich's mother fled to the home of their German next door neighbor. Earlier that day, he had listed <coughs> boards in the fence between their homes in anticipation of an emergency. Several weeks later, the man was waylaid. He was one of many whites assaulted during and after the riots for having come to a black person's aid. During the third attack, rioters ran amok in Marich's home for about an hour until the police arrived on the scene. What a home. Its interior was dismantled, furniture was missing or broken from basement to attic, evidences of the worst vandalism prevailed. A fire kindled in one of the upper rooms was discovered in time to prevent a conflagration. Marich's parents knew it would be foolhardy to remain in their home another night. Like droves of other New Yorkers, 
They took refuge in a police station. After nightfall, police officers escorted Marich's parents to the East River to catch a steamboat to Williamsburg. After collecting their children, Mrs. Lyons took them farther out of harm's way while Mr. Lyons secured their home and salvaged whatever he could. And so the rest of the book is how a family dramatized, who loses so much that they've worked for, start over again. Um, in the end, the father decides not in New York, so they end up in Providence, and then she goes to her school ordeal and, and graduates. And then she comes back to, well, not back to really, but <coughs> what is, how does Maricha, what does she do when she finishes high school? She becomes that most wonderful, noble, <laughs> magnificent thing, the thing that when people, when I was a kid, and they said, what do you want to be? You grow up, the thing I used to be. She became a teacher. And that was another reason that, that I did the book, is because she was a teacher, and I wanted to be a teacher. And also to say, in a way to say to kids that <coughs> people who become teachers are great. I mean, you know, I just wanted to, to do a book that honors a teacher, that you didn't have to be um, like a Frederick Douglass, do as exactly what he did, but as he did, which was live not for yourself alone. Um, that part really influenced, I think, um, Marisha was much younger than when he visited the home. Yeah, she wasn't born, it was her grandmother. It was the grandmother. Right, it was the grandmother. But she wasn't born then. No, but she heard the stories. Oh, she heard And then the later, that, yeah, and of course then remember, the black middle class is very small. So she grows up with this story, and of course, because Frederick Douglass is huge. Um, plus, remember, she's named after someone in the Remen family, and Charles Remen was one of the people who first brought Frederick Douglass. Yeah. So they all, they all knew each other. And I love the part later on when she visits Washington and Douglas gets word that she's there and he calls for her and says, I remember your grandmother's kindness to me. Okay, and so when I did this book, I had in mind what you brilliant people have done, which is making connections. I mean, I think that's what we're supposed to do with the history, is just not tell it because this is what happened, but show them that it's their story too. Because the same thing keeps happening over and over again. I wonder how many of you, when you've done the draft riots, have you gotten into the issue of class? And paralleled it to maybe other riots? I mean, again, you have the people on the bottom mad at each other. The blacks did not oppress the Irish, and the Irish weren't really the primary oppressors of the blacks, but yet, why do they fight? First of all, why did people whip up the Irish? Who benefited from that? What did the Irish have to gain from, the, from going off like that? They were already demonized. I mean, if you ever look at 19th century, illustrations of sure. Irish people? Yeah. Mm -hmm. like yeah. yeah. And monkeys are uh, monkeys. awful. But again, it's like the people who ought to be in solidarity are always divided. And again, I think if you look at other examples in history, you look at labor <coughs> movements and issues, you can show kids what what is going on here. <coughs> we try to do that in the scene to show the viewpoints and have uh, the writers speak from different viewpoints because it happened at a parallel time. I, I hadn't read very much, but I had seen Gangs of New York with Scorsese. It's actually part of the same mission. And how miserably these Irish people lived in the platforms. And then they went at each other when the, dra when the, riot, when the uh, draft occurred. They really did not want to serve this country. They didn't feel that they were accepted as Americans begin with, so why would they want to serve? Same way I an African American would feel at the same time, why should I be drafted for something that you're not respecting me? So they would have had a similar view, but weren't given the opportunity. And of course, the Senate Force said that African Americans were not permitted to serve at that time, which would cause resentment from the Irish to them. Because they're saying I'm fighting. Because at this time, the Emancipation Proclamation has been, and, and the war has shifted to be not to be about not only saving the Union. So you have these people think I have to fight for these people. Well, then if they're free, they're gonna come north and take my job. 